Hello, hello! Welcome back to Loki's Library, and if you are new here, welcome! I am your librarian, Katrina, and this is where I am reading through the enormous library books that you see behind me, and then I give you a quick synopsis and tell you what I think about them. So if you like books, just aren't sure what to read next, hit that subscribe button, like and share my videos, and let me know what you think in the comments. This month, I am generally exploring the Great Depression, so this week's book is called exactly that. It is The Great Depression, America 1929-1941 to by Robert S. McElveen. The accompanying cocktail is called Recession Depression. It is one and a half ounces of citron vodka, uh, a half ounce of triple sec, a half ounce of lemon juice, and two dashes of lime cordial. So let's do this. So this book is not technically mine. It was loaned to me by my dad along with last week's book. Now last week's book was great, had a ton of great information and explored the ramifications of FDR's policies. This week's book made me question if I am in fact my dad's favorite because honestly around page 19 of the introduction I was wondering if my dad was mad at me or if I had in some way offended him. Well, it's just a hair under one and a half ounces but I was not going to buy an entire bottle of citrus vodka just for this one cocktail. So we'll call that good. This book actually has two introductions, the, the foreword to the first edition and then the intro to the 25th edition. Now the author should not have added the introduction to the 25th edition, it added nothing to the book or to the story, and made him look like a bitter angry man who could not stand that someone, namely interestingly enough the author of last week's book, Amity Schles, might have had a different opinion than he did. Like she might have read the same resources and reached wildly different conclusions from him. In fact, his entire intro to the 25th edition was spent smearing Schley's book, The Forgotten Man and New History of the Great Depression. Except it wasn't so much her book he was smearing as her, mocking her credentials as an economist and pointing out with a great deal of smugness that he is nothing so lowly as an economist. He is a historian. And thus, the only one qualified to interpret history for those of us who studied something other than history, because books don't actually think. I mean, I hated him already just from that. Anyone who feels that knowledge only comes from those qualified to dispense it is an idiot. I mean, you wrote a book, dude, and seriously, you think that yours is the only book people should read and ever believe is the history, the be-all, end-all? Screw you, dude. He also makes it very clear from the very beginning that only Democrats are good people. Uh, Democrat and liberal equals good, Republican and conservative equals bad. And Hoover was bridging the gap between the two and thus is an honorary liberal in McElveen's book. Like literal and metaphorical in his book. Hoover is the bridging gap and was an overall decent man, which he was. He was a decent human being, but he also thinks that he was a decent president. And there's just not enough, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I can't quite get there to being a decent president because he did make some colossal fuck-ups. But Coolidge and Reagan are everything that is wrong with America. No joke. The, a book about the Great Depression was used to bash Reagan's policies 50 years later. Oh, and remember how I said we were blessed to be in the presence of a great historian who would not deign to sully his mind with anything as lowly as economics? He then spends the rest of the book, after the introduction, um, trying to explain multiple, multiple economic theories, everything from Adam Smith to John Maynard Keynes, ultimately deciding that Keynesian economics is the answer to all historical woes. Laissez-faire has run its course and caused the stock market to crash and only government spending could bring us out of it. So, I'm gonna need a little alcohol for this one. This, this was this just, my brain hurts. My brain hurts, oh no. It was supposed to be two dashes of lime juice. You know what? Two dashes. Fuck it. That's my two dashes of lime juice. This is how off I am right now. I grabbed the wrong fucking citrus. So let's give you a brief rundown of those terms, because if you don't know what they are, and most people don't, you aren't going to understand just how irritating this was to read. This entire book was irritating. Did I do the triple sec? Yeah. Yes? Yes. Oh my god. Well, I better have done the triple sec because I don't have enough vodka left to fix it if I didn't. I think I did the triple sec. You know what? If not, I'm about to have a shot of vodka with a little extra citrus. Whatever. So, laissez faire is a quote, and this is a direct quote from Investopedia. I will include the link is an economic theory from the 18th century that opposed any government intervention in business affairs. The driving principle behind laissez faire 
a French term which translates to leave alone, literally let you do, is that the less the government is involved in the economy, the better off business will be, and by extension, society as a whole. Check this out. Laissez-faire was Adam Smith's theory, and that built America into an economic powerhouse, put us in the position to loan millions of dollars to other countries of Europe during and after World War I, and uh, yeah, made us the richest nation on earth. McIlvain points out multiple other economic depressions in U.S. history, 1837, 57, 73, and 93, I think were the ones he pointed out, without ever connecting the dots that what caused these economic depressions was government interference in what was otherwise a functioning market. Um, the Depression of 1837 was caused by Andrew Jackson's interference in banking. Same with 1857, I think 73 and 93 were caused by tariffs. The government interferes, the market crashes. Now, the stock market crash of 1929 is kind of an anomaly here because the government did not interfere, at least not directly in the form of bank interference or tariffs on products. And in this case, it, it was a case of capitalism run amok. You'd be hard pressed to say otherwise because all the evidence is there that this was capitalism run amok, right? Well, that's a glowy cocktail. And if the market had been left alone, just left alone, which is what Andrew Mellon, you know, the second most brilliant Secretary of Treasury we've had behind Alexander Hamilton. Y'all love Hamilton, right? I mean, y'all worshipped him when that musical came out, at least. Um, then the, the market would have corrected because all of the bad businesses would have no longer existed. All right? Roosevelt stepped in and basically gave the banks a bailout. That is covered in the book. I'm not coming back to that because... Like, my mind is blown that government bailouts are a good thing. Bail out the bankers who caused this mess. Sure, that's a quality way to do business. The Smoot-Hawley tariff and Hoover's subsequent raising of taxes on people absolutely contributed to the coming shit show, and, the, and that's unquestionable. Now, Keynesian's, Keynesian economics, which is what McIlvain thinks is the be-all, end-all, and perfect form of economics, is the belief that demand drives supply meaning people should only be producing what is needed, like food, not what is wanted, like televisions and cars and things like that. He actually spends a not inconsiderable amount of time bemoaning advertising companies and how evil they are for making people want things. It's like lemonade. So from Investopedia again, we get, and this is kind of a long one, the most basic principle of Keynesian economics is that demand, not supply, is the driving force of an economy. Uh, at the time, and this was like the 1930s and 40s, conventional economic wisdom held, the, or excuse me, the 20s, because Keynes came around right at the Depression. Conventional economic wisdom held the opposite view, that supply creates demand, because aggregate demand, the total spending for and consumption of goods and services by the private sector and the government drives supply. Total spending determines all economic outcomes from the production of goods to the employment rate. Another basic principle of Keynesian economics is that the best way to pull an economy out of a recession is for the government to increase demand by infusing the economy with capital. In short, spending is the key to economic recovery. So we should only be spending on things that are good for us, like food, not like cars or televisions, because advertising is evil and makes us all want things. Like, I don't even get how he makes that connection. How can he make the connection that spending money is bad unless the government does it? At one point in the book, he says, you know, capitalism is great, but it needs a little bit of socialism. That's like saying, it's great that you're totally healthy, right? Your ideal, perfect weight, perfect height, perfect everything. Your skin is glowing, you're fantastic. You just have a little bit of cancer, but that's okay. It's just a little bit of cancer. I don't think any doctor is going to tell you there's anything good about a little bit of cancer and any economist is going to tell you there's nothing good about a little bit of socialism. So this is McIlvain's pet theory on the proper way to run a country, that Keynesianism is the way to go and all other things will drive the country into madness and mayhem. Government should just spend and spend and spend and we the people should just pay for it with our incredibly high tax dollars, except we should only be taxing the very rich because the very poor need all the help they can get. Help me, save me, big daddy government. I can't do it without big daddy government rescuing me. He highlights the incredibly asinine programs that Roosevelt endorsed during his, his four terms, like specifically two terms for the, you know, 29 to 41, or 32 to 38 would be the first two terms, right? Third term, World War II ramps up. Programs, example, for example, like paying farmers not to farm. So if 
demand is driving what we should be producing and demand is there for food, let's pay the producers of food not to produce food. I mean, does that actually make sense to anybody except for this guy who, you know, thinks that Keynes is brilliant? There's literally not enough food to go around and the government is paying farmers not to produce it. And with some pretty predictable consequences, the, the big farms in the South where sharecropping was still a thing started accepting government money not to farm and evicting their tenants, which was 100% predictable if you follow Henry Hazlitt's, you know, economics in one lesson. He could have told you that was going to happen because, hey, you're getting paid money from the government not to farm, so why would you allow sharecroppers to live rent-free when you can rip the tenants out, rip the buildings down, and turn the entire thing, all of it, into farmland and get paid more money to not farm the farmland by the government. Entirely predictable consequences. I strongly suspect that the real reason FDR was elected four times had absolutely nothing to do with any level of competence on his part because, frankly, every program he promoted was an absolute shit show of bureaucratic incompetence. Like, Witness the details that Schley's provided in last week's book on Schechter versus the National Recovery Administration, right? And uh, it had more to do with his successfully building up a cult of personality around himself. Remember two years ago, back in 2022, I read Frank DeCotter's book, How to Be a Dictator, the Cult of Personality in the 20th Century? And FDR didn't actually do anything for anybody except himself when he got himself elected four times. I feel like I was... I feel like I was tricked into reading another book on FDR this month. This is not the book I had planned for FDR. I still have another book planned on him that's like twice as long. All right, I'm using vacation time to read this thing and now I have to read two books about this motherfucker this month. So unfair. I really didn't think I was my dad's favorite. <laughs> McIlvain points out many times in many instances on FDR's humanity, including that FDR had a you know very long-lived affair and uh, hinting that Eleanor may have been gay, and she may have been, I don't know, I haven't gotten that far. Maybe she was, maybe she wasn't. But I swear that the reason that McIlvain loved FDR so much is that FDR was such a great politician. And uh, where I come from, that is not a compliment. Politician is a dirty word. Apparently McIlvain does not feel the same way. Okay, the book. So all of what I said above was in the book, all right, except for the, in, ex the uh, definitions from Investopedia. Obviously those are from the internet. There were like two chapters in this book where I actually learned something interesting, chapter nine and chapter 10 out of 15. Chapter nine was about culture and he covered the movies that came out in the 1930s and some of the overarching themes, how the movies represented the bad guys as capitalists and the good guys were always the common man. This uh, incidentally may also have assisted Roosevelt with his reelections. All right, we all know how Hollywood loves to interfere. Uh, he discussed how the government provided funding for artists during this time, and that was a great humanitarian thing. Now, look, it's not that artists don't deserve to eat. They, they need to eat. They deserve to eat. Sure. It's that if what they are producing isn't good enough to support themselves, then why do my tax dollars have to do it? For more on the topic of money and arts, I would actually refer you to the Writer Dojo podcast, which is produced by Larry Correa and Steve Diamond. They cover this topic a lot. They cover it in terms that most people understand except for those who are failing authors and feel like they deserve to be paid regardless. They probably also love FDR. Not, not Larry Correa, Steve Diamond. I'm pretty sure they hate FDR as much as I do. You know what he did not mention in this book? That while FDR was so very concerned with the common man having access to the arts, nowhere in the book did McIlvain mention Andrew Mellon's granting of the National Gallery, which happened during the Great Depression. I learned that, of course, from last week's book. Chapter 10, I learned about how much union membership rose during the 1930s, which I think I sort of knew just from like a logical point, right? But he covers how that came about, and that, and that was useful knowledge to have. So, you know, give the devil his due. It wasn't all bad just mostly irritating to slog through it to get to two good chapters. The rest of the book was waxing poetical about how great and fantastic FDR was and that FDR's only failing is that he didn't take Keynesian economics theory far enough. If he had spent more, the depression would have ended in year one. And his absolute lack of understanding of economics was phenomenal. And he's proud of this ignorance. Uh, he advocates deficit spending, that if you don't know, it's where the government spends money it doesn't have. It just keeps spending it. For those of you who aren't in the government, this would be, I'll give you an example here, where you don't have enough money to buy whatever you want, like all the books, right? So you put books on a credit card. 
only instead of buying a book on the credit card and paying it off, you know, your next payday, you just keep buying more and more books on that same card until you've maxed out the credit card. And then instead of paying off that credit card, you open a new credit card so you can keep buying books. And instead of paying off any of the credit cards, you just pay the minimum balance each month, allowing those interest rates to keep accruing higher and higher and opening up more and more credit cards until you can't afford to pay anything anymore. At which point you declare bankruptcy. That's what you and I would do. The government just keeps spending and spending and spending and then telling us all that we need to pay more in taxes to cover their spending. Um, with the government, it's usually military spending, not books, but that's, that's basically the idea. The uh, other delightful bond moth that McIlvain put out there is that savings is good. We should all have savings, but too much savings hurts your fellow man. Not sure how. Not at all sure how that happens. Um, but everybody who's actually good at saving and budgeting should be punished for being good at that by having their savings taxed at normally high rates by the, for the government military or government spending. Excuse me, I threw in the military. Uh, this is incidentally what's going on today, um, along with his lack of economic knowledge, he doesn't understand compound interest, which is how the rich actually get rich. It's not just that they find a way to provide value for their fellow man by creating like Amazon.com or Tesla or Facebook. They create value in their own way. It's that they then take their money, invest it, and allow that money to grow. A book that came out in the 1930s that was very popular and has been reviewed on this channel is The Richest Man in Babylon, which basically explain, explained economic theory for dummies, included compound interest. Let your money work for you. This is something the rich have mastered and the rest of us have not. I don't blame the rich for my own failing on that. That's my fault. This, this book was a dredge to get through. I am not sure what I did wrong to make my dad hate, hand me this book to read, but I'm, I'm going to go apologize now and hope that I uh, haven't been written out of the will. And I'll see you guys next Sunday. Bye.